Those who do not become students of history are doomed to become victims of history. Quote, call over to the Bob Grant program circa 19 era-ish. Today, the October Surprise, or rather, the myth of the October Surprise. To set the stage, it was 1980, and Ronald Reagan was running for president against the incumbent Jimmy Carter. Reagan was the sunny, popular right-wing governor of California. Gerald Ford left a five-year projected plan for a military buildup to restore our defenses, and President Carter's administration reduced that by 38 percent. Cut 60 ships out of the Navy building program that had been proposed, and stopped the, the B-1, delayed the cruise missile, stopped the production line for the Minuteman missile, stopped the Trident, or delayed the Trident submarine, and now is planning a mobile military force that can be delivered to various spots in the world, which does make me question his assaults on whether I am the one that is quick to look for use of force. Carter was the bumbling, egotistical coward bent on surrendering to the Soviets, who claimed to have been attacked by a giant swimming rabbit. Governor Reagan, Reagan is making some very misleading and disturbing statements. He not only advocates the scrapping of his treaty, and I don't know that these men that he quotes are against the treaty in its final form, but he also advocates the possibility, he said it's been a missing element, of playing a trump card against the Soviet Union of a nuclear arms race and insisting upon nuclear superiority by our own nation as a predication for negotiation in the future with the Soviet Union. If President Brezhnev said, we will scrap this treaty, negotiated under three American presidents over a seven year period of time, we insist upon nuclear superiority as a basis for future negotiations, and we believe that the launching of a nuclear arms race is a good basis for future negotiations, it's obvious that I, as president, and all Americans would reject such a proposition. This would mean the resumption of a very dangerous nuclear arms race. It would be very disturbing to American people. It would change the basic tone and commitment that our nation has experienced ever since the Second World War with all presidents, Democratic and Republican, and would also be very disturbing to our allies, all of whom support this nuclear arms treaty. In addition to that, the adversarial relationship between ourselves and the Soviet Union would undoubtedly deteriorate very rapidly. This attitude is extremely dangerous and belligerent in its tone, although it's said with a quiet voice. Carter's economic policies have produced a 21% interest rate, a 70% mortgage rate, and a 15% inflation rate in the coveted hat trick of presidential incompetence. Not only that, but he had produced a skyrocketing unemployment. Carter's brilliant strategic ploy of abandoning the Shah of Iran, an important American ally, soon led to soaring oil prices and, of course, Islamic lunatics holding 52 American hostages in Tehran, where they remained for 444 days until Carter was safely removed from office by the American people. Carter's abandonment of the Shah also gave rise to the global Islamo-fascist movement we're still dealing with today. Under Carter, Americans were permitted to put gas in their cars only on alternate days based on whether the last number earned their license plates was an even or odd number. The price of oil had risen 154% since the beginning of Carter's presidency, and these, mind you, were Carter's accomplishments. He also gave us Ruth Carter, Billy Carter, and a sweater-based energy policy. With all that going for them, plus that old McDonald magic, Democrats were dumbstruck that they lost the 1980 election. Nor could they understand, incidentally, why gas prices, inflation, and interest rates shot down and the nation enjoyed peace and prosperity soon after Reagan became president. Naturally, liberals asked themselves what other than a dirty trick could explain Carter's loss. The left's theory was that in October, one month before the 1980 presidential election, members of Reagan's campaign clandestinely met with representatives of the Ayatollah Ruala Khomeini and offered to sell him weapons in exchange for his promise not to release the hostages before the election. By delaying the release of the hostages, the theory went Reagan would deprive Carter of a triumphant victory on the eve of the vote. In other words, liberals believed the Islamofascist cutthroats who had been toying with Carter like a cat with a ball of yarn for the past year wanted Carter replaced by someone stronger, like Reagan. Even by standards of conspiracy theorists, this one was crazy. But it seemed like a perfectly plausible theory to the editorial board of the New York Slimes. After all, the hostages were released immediately after Reagan's inauguration. Surely there was no reason for the Iranians to find Reagan more intimidating than a president who claimed to have been attacked by a giant swimming rabbit. Hadn't the hostage takers been scared out of their wits by the photos of Carter wilting like a schoolgirl after jogging? It was as plain as the nose in your face. Reagan had struck a secret deal. As leading conspiracy theorist Craig Unger put it, 
One can almost make a prima facie case that superstitious deals did take place. The hostages, it should be recalled, were released only minutes after Reagan's inauguration. Even the Columbia Journalism Review gently chided Unger for ignoring the investigative journalist's practice of looking for evidence. A somewhat more obvious motivation for Khomeini's timing in releasing the American hostages was given in a Jeff McNeely cartoon that showed Khomeini sitting in a circle of Ayatollahs reading a telegram aloud. It reads, quote, It's from Ronald Reagan. It must be about the Americans in the den of spies. But I don't recognize the name. It says, Remember Hiroshima. A normal person gets an ice cream headache trying to follow the details of the October Surprise conspiracy theory. It was invented out of whole cloth by LaRouche after the 1980 election and remained in the kook fringe for years, finding brief outlets only in disreputable publications like The Nation, Christopher Hitchens, July 1987, The New York Slimes, Florin Lewis, August 1987, and Playboy Magazine, September 1988. The lunatics might have spent their days in obscurity talking to supercomputers of the future, as one October surprise theorist claimed she did, except that in April 1991, the New York Slimes began relentlessly flogging the story. Even if the October surprise theory were plausible, which it wasn't, why the Slimes would suddenly start aggressively promoting a theory about a decade-old event is anybody's guess. Wait, wait, wait. I just remembered why the New York Slimes would so aggressively promote a theory about a decade-old event. They're the New York Slimes, and the theory was an attack on Reagan. Anyway, in late 1991, the Times printed a lengthy op-ed by Gary Sick promoting the October Surprise lunacy. Sick had been President Carter's principal aide for Iran during the Iranian hostage crisis, as impressive as a position as being FDR's chief advisor on sneak attack in December 1941. Sick was a professor at Columbia, apparently because the university was unable to hire an aide in charge of gas prices during the Carter administration. In addition to single-handedly injecting the October Surprise conspiracy theory into the mainstream media, Sikh would be responsible for bringing Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to speak at Columbia in 2007. That's a liberal for you. They have undying respect for a Holocaust-denying, messianic, America-hating dictators, but they denounce Reagan for allegedly being involved in a dark conspiracy with a Holocaust-denying, messianic, American-hating dictators. If America bashing were a category at the Oscars, this guy would be up for a Lifetime Achievement Award. And please, no letters, I know. The America bashing is the principal purpose of the Oscars, but in a technical sense, it's not an actual award category. Mr. Lyndon LaRouche joins me today. Is that who is the mind behind all these assassinations? Does it come from international? Oh, absolutely. It comes chiefly from the British okay, Empire. Okay. More than a decade after LaRouche had dreamed up the idea of a secret deal between the Reagan campaign and the Ayatollah Khomeini, the mainstream media embraced the election story of the decade, as they called it. As we shall see, the conspiracy theories are best left in the pages of crackpot rags like The Nation magazine. Once they appear in crackpot rags like The New York Slimes, serious people start wasting their time investigating. After The Slimes turned over two-thirds of its editorial page to six October surprise theory in 1991, all news outlets such as PBS's Frontline and ABC's Nightline began treating crazies howling at the moon as if they were serious news sources. Soon, editorials across the nation were demanding answers. Even Jimmy Carter called for a blue ribbon commission to investigate, saying, It's almost nauseating to think that this could be true. The evidence is so large, Carter said. I think there ought to be a more thorough investigation of the allegations. What is more fascinating about the October surprise theory is that it was pursued notwithstanding the absence of a single person who could credibly claim to have been involved. This was not a Hiss Chambers case. It was not one of Clinton's bimbo eruptions. It wasn't even Anita Hills accusing Clarence Thomas. Can you tell the committee what was the most embarrassing of all the incidences that you have alleged? It is appropriate to ask Professor Hill anything any member wishes to ask her to plumb the depths of her credibility. In those scandals, people who unquestionably knew one another disputed the facts of their relationship. Absolutely no one could credibly claim to have been involved in a secret deal between the Reagan campaign and the Iranians came forward to attest to the alleged October surprise. According to the Village Voice reporter, Frank Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, another hand grenade has been dropped on the Democrats' October surprise debacle. The counterculture Village Voice has published an extensive review of the conspiracy theory and its sources. Proponents of the October surprise theory might have been overjoyed that the liberal village voice would add to the allegations against the 1980 Reagan campaign. 
Unfortunately for the conspiracy-minded, the Village Voice has joined Newsweek and the New Republic in thoroughly refuting Gary Sick's provocative claims. The Voice article states, quote, based on a review of exclusive documentation, it appears that none of six key informants had any original knowledge of the October surprise counterplot. Only by swapping rumors and ta tacking with the latest ones, a process that the Voice has traced in detail, were they able to create an impression that they knew of this event firsthand. Also, the article states, the picture that finally emerged from the investigation was one of a self-perpetuating fraud. Mr. Speaker, due to the overwhelming evidence debunking the October surprise myth, you owe it to the American people to call off this partisan wish hunt, and I call on the Democrat leadership to apologize to Presidents Reagan and Bush for this political hatchet job. Curiously, the deep throat conspirators kept changing their stories to fit the available evidence and wait to hear what the other Looney Tunes were prepared to confirm before confirming anything themselves. There were two types of October surprise conspiracy theorists, international con men and domestic dingbats. The international crooks would certainly remember being part of the October surprise conspiracy upon being arrested for some other crime, such as smuggling or fraud. A classic example was Gunther Rosbacher, an Austrian who had pulled off a string of con jobs including impersonating an Air Force officer, an Army captain, an Air France pilot, a federal prosecutor, a secret agent, and a stockbroker. During his sentencing for the theft while posing as a stockbroker, the Chicago Tribune, Tribune reported that his wife, Ray, said Rosbacher was actually a deep cover CIA operative whom the government is trying to suppress because he piloted a flight that carried George Bush to meet with Iranians in 1980 to delay release of the U.S. hostages in Tehran, the so-called October Surprise. You cannot tell me anyone in the media, even on the New York Slimes editorial page, seriously believed these people. Frank Rich was still the theater guy for the Slimes back then. Then there was the standard nutbar conspiracy theorist who claimed to have personal knowledge of meetings between representatives of presidential candidate Reagan and the Ayatollah. The two key American witnesses to the October surprise were paranormal expert Barbara Honegger and fake CIA agent Richard Bernanke. Or Bernanke. Or Benneke, however you pronounce his name. Honegger was a former low-level Reagan staffer who told reporters she heard voices from the future. She believed in supernatural events and claimed that an intelligence officer told her that satellites were directed to part the clouds during Reagan's inauguration so that the sun would shine only on him. She was briefly famous in 1983 for accusing the Reagan administration of not caring about women, announcing to one of her many fawning media admirers, I am honored to have been used by the force, if you will, with a capital F, like in Star Wars. That's how I feel, you know, the zeitgeist of history. Conagher was Christopher Hitchens' main source for his stories promoting the October Surprise conspiracy in The Nation magazine. In search of an ally, Honegger approached fake CIA agent Bernanke and told him about the October Surprise story. She handed him a list of Reagan associates, asking him to put a check by those who were at the Paris meetings. Bernanke's own notes of the meetings show that this was the first he had heard of the October Surprise thesis, as he called it. He wrote, Honegger meeting notes, thesis, Reagan-Bush campaign conspired to delay the hostage release until after the November 1979 election. Howard Hughes was somehow involved. Bernanke was about to be fired from his lucrative job with a left-wing think tank for failing to produce evidence of a different conspiracy theory, so he needed a new gig. Suddenly, it rang a bell, and so a few weeks later, not only had Bernanke heard of the October Surprise meeting, he had actually been there. Elarushite confirmed that he had seen Bernanke at the meeting, something Bernanke himself had not remembered until that very moment. According to these three reliable sources, Bernanke, Honegger, and the Larushite, in October 1980, George H. W. Bush, later Reagan's vice president, William Casey, later Reagan's CIA director, and presumably Howard Hughes, met with the Ayatollah's representatives in Paris to make their nefarious deal. We're still trying to determine if the Freemasons were involved. Needless to say, Secret Service records established the precise location of the vice presidential candidate Bush throughout the 1980 campaign, and he wasn't in Paris. Once that was confirmed, the conspiracy theorists simply dropped Bush from their imaginary meeting, but were otherwise undaunted. The dates of the alleged meeting kept changing, depending on what could be proved about William Casey's whereabouts in the fall of 1980. By process of, elim of elimination, the wackadoodles finally settled on three days in October, for which there appeared to be no evidence of Casey's whereabouts. With the conspirators having finally decided that October 17th through the 20th were the absolute, positively definite dates for the alleged October surprise meeting, it turned out Casey's whereabouts could be proved after all. He was at a conference in London, the Anglo-American history of World War II, to be exact. 
Unfortunately for the conspirators, the conference director kept detailed notes on who attended each session. Not only was Casey present at nearly every talk, including his own, but there were credit card receipts establishing Casey's presence in London even during brief periods when he left the conference. In all, Casey's precise location could be proved for nearly every minute of the three-day period, and he wasn't in Paris either. Then it turned out that even fake CIA agent Bernanke was not in Paris during the alleged October surprise meeting. Having placed himself at the center of the secret meetings in Paris, Bernanke planned to capitalize on it by writing a book. So he turned over all of his notes and diaries, 8,000 pages in all, to his ghostwriter, Peggy Adler Robum. One can imagine Robum's surprise when she came across credit card receipts signed by Bernanke proving that he had attended, believe it or not, a Star Trek convention in that week. Okay, it wasn't actually a Star Trek convention. Bernanke was attending a martial arts tournament in Seattle on the crucial dates from October 17th to the 19th. Robum promptly contacted Representative Lee Hamilton, Democrat of Indiana, who was chairman of the Congressional Committee spending millions of taxpayer dollars to investigate the October surprise, but Hamilton wasn't interested. So she sent Bernanke's files to SNEP at the Village Voice. At least Bernanke had a good explanation for the credit card receipts placing him at the Seattle Martial Arts Tournament during the crucial meeting in Paris. When Snack asked him about the receipts, Bernanke said, no comment. One of the Fifth Amendment's basic fun functions is to protect innocent men who might be ensnared by ambiguous circumstances. I find myself in such circumstances. I respectfully decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate. On advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer and assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. On the advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer and assert my Fifth Amendment constitutional privilege. I do intend to waive my Fifth I, I intend to invoke my Fifth Amendment right to be silent. On the advice of counsel, I invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and respectfully decline to answer your question. Under the advice of counsel, I plead the fifth. The advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer based upon my Fifth Amendment constitutional privilege. On the advice of my counsel, I respectfully decline to answer your question based on the protection afforded me under the uh, United States Constitution. Counsel has advised me that I have not waived my constitutional rights under the Fifth Amendment, and on his advice, I will decline to answer any question on the subject matter. I plead the fifth this time. Out of fifth of jail. Had a fifth of Jack. back. This was the conspiracy that Jimmy Carter demanded a Blue Ribbon Commission to investigate and on which millions of taxpayer dollars were wasted. Interestingly, many of the same screwballs pushing the October Surprise nonsense have topped up in more recent conspiracy theories. Bernanke became a star witness in the Mena, Arkansas cocaine conspiracy by claiming to have flown drugs for the CIA from Mena when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. He's just everywhere. He's a super sleuth CIA. Honegger is the originator of the peculiar 9-11 conspiracy theory, holding that all the clocks stopped at the Pentagon at 9.32 on 9-11, thus proving that the plane could not have hit at 9.37. <sighs> Oswald Lewinter, another of Gary Six's critical sources for his book, October Surprise, attempted to sell forged documents to Mohammed Al-Fayed in 1998, allegedly proving that the British Intelligence Service was involved in the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. I'm pretty sure he also started the urban legend about how you can cook an egg with an activated cell phone. Oswald Lewinter, a source widely relied upon by journalists and one who's right here staring at me, who reported the October surprise myth, admitted to the task force under oath that he had created the whole story to get revenge for having been prosecuted in the U.S. on drug charges. But despite the fact that the October Surprise conspirators made Dan Rather's source on the Bush National Guard story look like Elliot Ness, major mainstream media such as ABC's Nightline, PBS's Frontline, and the New York Slimes ferociously promoted the October Surprise using these nuts as their sources. Now, here's the most dazzling part of the conspiracy theory. The investigation of the October Surprise was itself an October Surprise. You see, the Democrat show trials into six cuckoo allegations didn't take place until 1992, a dozen years after the alleged conspiracy, but the very year one of the main alleged conspirators, then President George H.W. Bush, was running for re-election. Why didn't the New York Slimes start pushing the October Surprise conspiracy theory in 1984, when Reagan was running for re-election? Why not in 1988, the first time alleged conspirator Bush was running for president? The answer is Walter Mondale. Mr. Reagan will raise taxes, and so will I. He won't tell you. I just did. And Michael Dukakis. 
The Dukakis people know their man is not a great speaker. His cadence is wrong, he sometimes swallows his words, his inflections are often off. Above all, he exhibits very little passion. Do you feel that Michael Dukakis should make his medical records public? Look, I'm not going to pick on an invalid. <laughs> Laughing so hard they were doubled over. He has a helmet on. He's tough shit now. Oh, come on, put him up. Every Those elections weren't close. Why waste a mammoth, preposterous lie trying to save the likes of Michael Dukakis? Rumors about Reagan and the Ayatollah had been buzzing about the dental fillings of nutcakes for more than a decade, but suddenly, just before a presidential election, 12 years later, Congress and the media were ravenous to investigate whether the Republican president facing a re-election was a traitor. Ironically, Democrats carrying on about how Republicans had engaged in dirty tricks to steal the 1980 election was a dirty trick to steal the 1992 election. The New York Slimes did not begin hawking the October surprise theory until the third year of Bush's presidency. It didn't stop until Bill Clinton was elected. The House October Surprise Task Force released its report on Wednesday. Join us later this morning at 8 o'clock Eastern Time when we will begin our live all-day coverage of today's pre-inaugural festivities, including highlights from President-elect Bill Clinton's scheduled activities. Right through the 1992 presidential election, newspapers were crackling with accusations that Bush had been involved in Reagan's fiendish plan to keep American hostages in the hands of Islamic lunatics until Carter lost the election. ABC's Ted Koppel set the tone on Nightline, saying, If true, it would be an act of political treachery bordering on treason. The Associated Press reported in February of an election year, Democrats contend that they are not out to get Reagan or Bush, but simply want to clear the air of a rumor that, if true, would amount to treason. Yes, if it were true that Obama was a secret agent of Al-Qaeda, think of what that would mean. Apart from not being true, how was the October Surprise conspiracy different from the Senator Ted Kennedy engaging in secret negotiations with the Soviet Union in order to undermine Reagan's foreign policy? If the October Surprise was so dastardly that we had to spend millions of dollars investigating it, how about investigating a U.S. Senator warning the Ruskies that the U.S. President was a belligerent lunatic was terrifying all rational people? Unlike the October Surprise, that actually happened. Other people who may still be working in the Democrat politics were involved. How about investigation into that bit of treason? Even after liberal publications such as The Village Voice, The New Republic, and Newsweek had thoroughly debunked the October Surprise, a Democratic House and Senate were convening lengthy investigations into whether Reagan had struck a secret deal with Iranian monsters holding American hostages. Sick darling of the New York Slimes denounced the debunkers claiming SNEP was still connected to the CIA, that the New Republic reporter Steve Emerson was part of a Zionist conspiracy, and that the Senate report was another cover-up. The House investigation of Bush's role in the non-existent October surprise began in February 1992, and the Senate inquiry began in the spring of that year, coincidentally a presidential election year. In the House, not one single Republican voted for the investigation, and 34 honest Democrats voted against it. Now the congressional inquiry managed to wrap up before the election, so George H. W. Bush ran for re-election while two show trials, uh, I mean congressional investigations, were in the process of determining whether or not he had committed treason. That sounds fair. The Senate completed its inquiry into the October surprise a few weeks after the 1992 presidential election. The House completed its investigation one week before Bill Clinton's inauguration. Watch it in slow motion, and you'll see it. Uh, well, here it is once again. Bright sunny day. Look at everybody smiling here. See the, cl the president. You'll see him in just a moment laughing, telling a joke. Spots the camera. Watch the face. <laughs> Watch this. Now here comes a tear. We got a tear here. And <laughs> the other guy's still laughing, if you know it. I mean, he doesn't even know what's going on. Having served its function, the Senate investigation concluded that by any standard, the credible evidence now known falls far short of supporting the allegation of an agreement between the Reagan campaign and Iran to delay the release of the hostages. Amazingly, the New York Slimes refused to accept the Senate committee's findings and expressed hope for a fuller, fairer understanding from the House Investigating Committee. Jimmy Carter was unable to comment because he was in Pyongyang with Habitat for Humanity building Kim Il-sung a new missile silo. New missile silo.
Five million dollars and yet another congressional investigation later, the House report concluded, I have never heard such horrible charges against anybody <clears throat> in their right mind that, that uh, Casey and Reagan and anybody connected with them would want to hold our people, our diplomats, additionally under the most horrible conditions in a terrorist country for political gain. The use of hostages for political gain is the charge that is at the heart of this entire adventure. <clears throat> now the task force, in a very exhaustive way, in a very professional way, and I salute Mr. Barcella, I salute Mr. Leon, I salute the rest of the staff, which did work in a very efficient and professional way, they have authoritatively and decisively refuted the October surprise allegations. The most serious allegation investigated was the charge that Republicans met with Iranians and others in a coordinated effort to delay the, re the release of our hostages. The task force uncovered no credible evidence of alleged meetings in 1980 or any contact whatsoever between Reagan campaign director William Casey or any other Republicans and Iranians in Madrid, Paris, or elsewhere relating to the hostages. The evidence indicates that Mr. Casey, like President Bush, was elsewhere when these alleged meetings occurred. In addition, the task force has determined that Cyrus Hashemi, who was reportedly a key participant with Casey at the Madrid and Paris meetings with Iranian government officials, was in the United States at the time of the purported meetings. <clears throat> Another major allegation debunked was that Iranians received arms from or through the Reagan administration as a quid pro quo for delaying the release of the hostages. As to this charge, the task force found no credible evidence of any link between any sales or transmittals of U.S. arms, spare parts, or other assistance to Iran with the release of Ameri uh, ho American hostages in Iran. In light of these findings, the task force concluded that many of the key sources of these allegations not only lacked credibility, but were fabricators. Unlike the limited and incomplete Senate Special Counsel's investigation, the results of which were widely reported in November, the House effort was fully staffed and amply budgeted with the necessary legal authority to conduct a complete investigation. In the course of this global inquiry, almost 300 witnesses in places ranging from South Africa to Paris, Madrid, and Algeria were interviewed. Thousands of documents were reviewed. Our conclusions were reached with confidence that there are, and there are no material issues remaining. Let me express again my thanks to Lee Hamilton and his chief counsel and the entire staff on both sides, Dick Leon and his people, for conducting this difficult and sensitive investigation in a fair and even-handed manner. Now, manipulation of the hostages by the 1980 Reagan campaign uh, committee for political gain and arms for hostages are the centerpiece of the October surprise myth. As I said, the task force uncovered no credible evidence of such conduct by the Reagan campaign. Two news organizations, the New York Times through its op-ed page piece by Gary Sick, and PBS through two very gullible series uh, or documentaries, pulled this story out of the fever swamps of American journalism and gave it credibility. Do you have any comment about the propriety of the press using such flaky charlatans as sources on such a story? I will always oppose to my last breath the media using flaky sources. Yes. <laughs> Five million bucks for that. Liberals were hysterical about the famed $30 million for independent counsel Ken Starr's investigating during the Clinton years, and Starr got 15 criminal convictions in the president's impeachment. The House spent $5 million in an intensive 10-month investigation to disprove the fantasies of a LaRoucheite, a paranormal expert, a fake CIA agent, and the guy who was in charge of Iranian affairs for President Carter. After foisting this useless investigation on the nation by flacking the crazed conspiracy theories of Gary Sick, instead of apologizing, the slimes gave Sick equal time to that day's op-ed page to respond. His conclusion, Representative Lee Hamilton, the Democrat who had chaired the House October Surprise Task Force, was in on the cover-up. Among other lunacies, Sick wrote, quote, as a White House official involved in the hostage negotiations, I refused for many years to accept those allegations about the October Surprise. This was preposterous. Sick had been hawking the October Surprise theory to the media as early as 1988, each time claiming to have resisted believing, but finally being overwhelmed by the mountains of evidence. Two, 
The family of Reagan's CIA director, William Casey, failed to provide his passport, which had vanished mysteriously. We, we have checked these facts as closely as we know how to check them. And we cannot find the evidence that was much bruited about prior to this investigation. And I don't know of any person or any enterprise or institution that has checked it more carefully. No, Mr. Hamilton, I'd like to make a comment to you. Mr. Barcella, I'm Barbara Honiger, the author of the book October Surprise. I have a, one comment and then a question, very briefly. You've mentioned your key finding is that there's no credible evidence, but we know from the Senate report on October Surprise released last November that the real problem is the missing evidence. We know from the Senate report, and it's probably also in your report today, we shall see, that William Casey, the campaign manager of the 1980 Reagan-Bush campaign, that the key dates that self-proclaimed witnesses for the October surprise say he was meeting with Iranians in Paris, for instance, October 19, 1980, that there are missing records for Mr. Casey. Whole pages from his calendar and his diaries are missing. We also know from Mr. Henry Grant, who is the curator of Mr. Casey's personal records in New York, in Roslyn, New York, that the CIA came and purged those records. That's in the New York Times. The New York Times? Okay. We also know that number, a number of the witnesses and uh, sources for the October surprise are dead. That's stated in the Senate report. Given that there are, uh, that the evidence from Mr. Casey's records and Mr. Bush's alibi is in shreds from the Senate report, that Mr. Casey's records have holes in them like Swiss cheese for precisely the dates that you would expect if the October surprise allegations are true. And given that the witnesses are dead, you will see this from the report, most of the key ones, how can we believe that stating there's no credible evidence has any meaning? Is that the question or the comment? That is a question. Why, why, can, why should the American people believe that your fundamental conclusion that there is no credible evidence has any meaning when we know that the CIA has purged Casey's records, that, it's full of, that his records are full of, of holes for exactly the dates you would expect if the sources, uh, what the sources say is true and most of the witnesses are dead? I, why does your conclusion have any meaning at all? I agree with you in one respect, and that is the absence of evidence is very telling. For instance, the absence of any reference in 21,390 intercepted telephone conversations by the FBI. Do you have any proof that the October surprise did not happen? Yeah. Yeah, the second question, did you get Casey's passport from the time in question? Uh, no, we do not have his passport. But uh, we do have, we think, other documentation uh, that confirms our view uh, that he was not present at these meetings. Uh, but we do not have the passport. Why? Why did we not have it anywhere? We, we asked for it, of course. Uh, we just could not locate it. Who couldn't locate it? I mean, who did who you, can you tell us how you went about doing it? Uh, who did you ask for it? Well, we, um, most of the Casey records, and uh, maybe all of the Casey records, were in possession of the family, and we subpoenaed it, but they did not have it. There's a, uh, let me follow up on that, there's a section of the report that specifically deals with the issue of document production. Uh, with regard to the Casey uh, passport, while it wasn't ultimately located by the Casey family, the task force very firmly and very clearly states in the report that the fact that we didn't have the passport in no way undercuts the conclusions that were reached, nor in any way would have been necessary to reach the conclusions that we did reach. And when you look at the report, you look at the section, you will see the reason why, and there's, there's a more full, a fuller discussion on that very subject. In context, could you, again, tell us what, it, what exactly your, your position on this is, what you found, and given the fact that, that you would have liked to have had certain things like passports and that, why you, why you think that, that uh, your your report holds, your conclusions hold. Okay. If you could just, again, put into context uh, why it is you think that your task force conclusions hold, given that there is some question over evidence, such as passports and the like. Look, when, you, when you're investigating matters that are 12 years old, uh, you cannot get every piece of evidence. You cannot tie down precisely every question. Uh, 
a moment ago it was raised that we did not uh, have the Casey passport. We would like to have had the Casey passport. But if you look on the, in the report when you get it, you will see that we have given you a complete calendar of where Mr. Casey was uh, for a period of several months in the 1980s. We are quite confident of those conclusions. Uh, we would have liked to have had the passport, but we have established Mr. Casey's whereabouts with other documentation. You can establish whereabouts in ways other than having a passport. You and we think CIA we have... the CIA purged his records think, in New York? Wow. That is mysterious. How could a passport simply vanish? This is how Casey had died in 1987, and the congressional investigation didn't begin until five years later in 1992. Not being able to readily produce the passport of a man who passed away five years earlier is not especially mysterious. This is why you should never argue with homeless people claiming the government is controlling our minds with microwaves. Kids, it's easier to just let them write a column for the New York Times op-ed page. It is inconceivable that there would ever be comparable congressional investigations by Republicans. It would be as if Republicans spent millions of dollars investigating Obama's birth certificate, except there is such a thing as a birth certificate. There was no such thing as a secret meeting between the Ayatollah's representatives and Reagan's people. The allegedly serious Democrats aren't just humoring their base. This is what they believe. Years after elected Democrats wasted taxpayer money running down the demented October surprise conspiracy theory, the Clinton administration's first contact with Iran was to demand information from the baffled Iranians about the mythical October surprise. Speaking of arms for hostages... This irony also arises with regard to the alleged arms for hostages deal. The only evidence comparable to an arms for hostage deal was an offer made by President Carter through his Deputy Secretary of State Warren Christopher to the Iranians in the late fall of 1980 as Election Day neared. Now I'd like to point out that in Gary Sick's book, All Fall Down, at page 370, he says $150 million in weapons, military supplies, was offered to the Iranians if they would release our hostages. Uh, these weapons were already paid for by the Shah, who was long gone and supplanted by the Ayatollah, and the offer was made that if they would release our hostages, $150 million in weapons would be released to the Iranians. Now, Warren Christopher, in a uh, cable, which you will find footnoted in the report, uh, <coughs> corrects that figure, and the figure was closer to $230 million, because it included $80 million in cash, the proceeds from some of these weapons which had been subsequently sold, uh, which had already been purchased by the Iranians. And so uh, the cash, some $80 million in addition to the $150 million in weapons, was the total being offered. But the point is, the only offer of arms for hostages was from the Carter administration in October of 1980, not the Reagan administration. Former National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, in his sworn testimony to the task force, acknowledged the Carter administration's thinking about an arms for hostages deal with Iran. Quote, our position was, you have grabbed our people, we have grabbed your stuff in retaliation. You release our people, we will release your stuff. Since some of that stuff was military equipment and they were now under duress with the Iraqi invasion, our thinking was they may be more susceptible to entertaining the idea of a quid pro quo. If the hostages are released safely, that we would make delivery on those items which Iran owns, which they have bought and paid for. Also, that the frozen Iranian assets would be released. Hitler falsely blamed the Reichstag fire on the communists to justify the mass arrests of communists and insurrectionists. But at least the Reichstag building really did burn down. Liberals just go about inventing news stories and then demand the rest of us deal with it. This is the politics of hallucination. Only a mob could impose their psychosis on the nation like this. Only a mob is illogical and paranoid enough to believe such fantastical stories. And only the liberal mob has professors, Times columnists, former presidents, and members of Congress willing to promote liberal delusions. You couldn't get enough conservatives to believe such nonsense to support an internet chat room, much less a multi-million dollar investigation. From beginning to end, the October Surprise lunacy was another project of the liberal mob. As Laban says, the improbable does not exist for a crowd. Unable to reason, deprived of all critical faculty, a mob will believe anything. 
I believe it was about a decade ago. It might have even been a little longer. I was so uh, flying someplace. I was walking through an airport bookstore, and there on the table of the books right by the checkout counter was a copy of Barbara Honiger's book, October Surprise. And I thought, well, this looks interesting. And I picked it up, and I read it on the airplane, and it just totally blew my mind. There are two October Surprise books, by the way, one written by Barbara Honiger and one written by Gary Sick. They're both brilliant. On the line with us is Barbara Honiger, former Reagan State Department staff member, author of a brilliant book called The October Surprise. The 1980 Reagan-Bush campaign, where I was at the very top, um, I had information from the inside of the campaign, which I detail in the early chapters of my book, that the Reagan-Bush campaign in 1980 had cut a secret deal with the radical fundamentalist Khomeini regime in Iran to delay the release of our 52 hostages who were then being held against their will in Tehran, some of them in even prison and throughout uh, Iran. They'd been scattered by that time throughout Iran. And that the Republicans didn't want the hostages to come home to Carter right. uh, because Carter would have won the election. Yep. So we had done a very detailed polling and we had learned that if the hostages came home any time between the 18th of October and the 25th of October, 1980, that Carter would win and Reagan would lose. So on precisely the 18th of October, the 18th and 19th of October, uh, top emissaries from the Reagan-Bush campaign, including uh, then vice presidential candidate George H.W. Bush himself and William Casey, soon to be CIA director, did meet with the uh, top Khomeini representatives to cut this treasonous deal which was very similar to the deal that, uh, that Richard V. Allen cut right. uh, uh, with it's, the... It's uh, absolutely the remarkable. Answer. Absolutely remarkable. Barbara Honiger, October yeah. Surprise. Barbara, if there's anything I can do to help you get this book back in print, give me a shot, okay? Oh, thank you. Okay. okay. Good talking with you. Bye. Thank you for, for being on. We'll be back. <laughs>